And Yahweh, Elohim, said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I am going to make a helper for him as his counterpart. Holy Yahweh Almighty, we're singing holy. Blog Talk Radio. It is good to give thanks unto Yahweh and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. It is good to give thanks unto Yahweh and to sing praises unto thy name, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning. And thy faithfulness every night. Upon an instrument of ten strings, upon a solemn tree, upon the heart with a solemn sound. For thou, O oh Yah, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in thy hand. It is good to give thanks unto Yahweh and to sing praises. Unto thy name, O Most High, it is good to give thanks unto Yahweh and to sing praises unto thy name. Those are planted in the house of Yah shall flourish in the courts of Yah. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. To show that Yah is upright, He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in Him. It is good to give thanks unto Yahweh and to sing praises unto Thy name, O Most High. It is good to give thanks unto Yahweh. And to sing praises unto thy name. Some more praise, some more praise. To sing with our voice and string. Some more praise, some more praise. Some more praise, some more praise. Him. He is the Elohim of the Israelites. He is Yahweh, our sovereign King. It is good to give thanks unto Yahweh and to sing praises unto thy name. O Most High, O Most High, Shalom, shalom, daughters of Zion, sisters, welcome, welcome, and greetings to each and every one of you. I love you dearly. Thank you for taking time out of your week to tune in tonight. This is Sister Ashley right here in the studio at the Tabernacle. I am representing the sisters here and the land here in Lafette, Straightway Ministries here. And Sister Jennifer, please tell me, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, I can hear you. Shalom, sisters, daughters of Zion. It's great to be here. I'm so happy to have you all tuned in. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedules to be with us tonight. Shalom. Hallelujah. Beautiful. And Sister Carolina is to my right with me tonight. Um, What a beautiful time we've had with her on the land and her helping us out. Um, She's really, really growing. So that's a good announcement for tonight. I always like to take a ministry break right in the beginning to give sisters extra time to log in for those who are just a few minutes late. And as well as anyone who is new, if you are new to the ministry and you need our ministry information, this is our beloved sister, Wenda, up in California. Canada, almost in California, up in Canada, uh, northern tribes of Israel or up north in the Canada area, and she will be speaking to you right now. So please grab your pens, your paper, and make notes 
Uh, we'll be right back with you, sisters. Get your pads ready, your paper, your pads, your pencils, your pens, everything you need, your Bibles, and strap yourselves in because I think tonight's show is going to be really exciting. Both Jennifer and I have a burning for tonight's message, so stay tuned. Shalom. This is Sister Wenda. I hope that all of you are enjoying this particular broadcast that you're listening to right now. We really appreciate each and every last one of you, our faithful listeners and supporters of the Straightway Truth Radio broadcast. We try to make sure we do our best to ensure that you have the best broadcast as well as the truth coming to you in the hour that we're living in right now. If you'd like to help us in this endeavor, your offering will be greatly appreciated in the work of the Ministry of the Most High Yah. Our mailing address for your gift, offering, or letter of support is... Pastor Charles Dowell, Jr. That's Pastor Charles Dowell, Jr. 632 Highway 52 Bypass West. That's 632 Highway 52 Bypass West. PMB number 1 Lafayette, Tennessee. And Lafayette is spelled L-A-F-A-Y-E-T-T-E, Tennessee, 37083. If you would like to contact us by way of phone, the country code is 1, area code 615-688-3025. You may leave a message there, and be the Father's will, we will do whatever we can to return your message. It is our hope and our prayer that as you continue to listen to the Straight Way Truth Ministry and as you apply the teachings of this ministry, that you are finding peace and growth within you, your family, and life as well. And do please tell others so that the truth may also have an impact and touch others' lives so that they may enjoy the benefits of the truth of Jesus Christ, just like we all are. Shalom. The King is coming. Hallelujah. Thank you again, Sister Wanda, for that beautiful ministry break I always love to use. I spoke today for the first time ever to a uh, sister who was new to me. I wasn't familiar with her name or her location, and I think it's Sister Dory, uh, if I'm not mistaken, because I wrote the message down for Elder Becker. She'll be trying to attend our Pentecost and uh, obviously going through the protocol and calling to ask permission. I just remember writing it, and I didn't say it or write my own note to say it tonight. So I hope that this, this phone call that I'm going to right now, I hope it's her, because I was looking forward to her call tonight. So let's take it. Area code 6610. 610, Pennsylvania? Shalom, Sister Ashley. Shalom. And Sister Jennifer, this is Sister Dory. Shalom. Bless you, you, Sister Dory. Bless Bless you, you, Sister. Thank you for overcoming all obstacles in your mind to call into tonight's show. Oftentimes people deal with nerves or deal with, you know, uh, not wanting to call in because they don't got much to say. But uh, we just want to hear your voice. Introduce yourself, sister, and say anything that's on your heart. Yes, I'm Sister Dory. Um, I just wanted to call and let you ladies know that I love the show. Um, I've learned a lot since listening, and I wanted to thank you, ladies. Well, bless you. Where are you located for those who are out there listening? I'm in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. And you um, fellowship with Brother Felix and his wife, Sister Melissa, right? Uh Melissa. Sister Melissa. Hallelujah. Anything else to share? Okay. Oh, and I've learned a lot since listening, and I just wanted to thank you, ladies. Everything you say is very inspiring. Well, thank you so much. Keep calling in anytime there's something to share, okay, sister? Oh, yes, ma'am. Hallelujah. Anything from you, Sister Jennifer? Bless you, my sister. Thank you for listening, and thank you for the encouragement. Thank you, sister. And I love you. Shalom. Oh, shalom. We love you you as well, each and every one of you. Shalom. All right. Well, let's, let's build tonight's show. There's no other callers. Please call in at any time, sisters, whether it pertains to tonight's topic or any previous ones, any questions you may have for the sisters here on the land. Um, or scattered abroad, anything that we may help you with, please let us know. We started our journey, what, three weeks ago, Sister Carolina, with Eve. We talked about Eve. We talked about her greed for gain and her discontentment. Um, We started telling each of you, for those of you who may be new tonight, that we will speak about a different woman of the Word, a woman and an example in the Bible, each week, so that we may grow from those examples. 
So Eve being the first, we moved on to Abigail, which was last week. Um, we talked about her bowels of compassion, her tender mercies, um, and her, what's another word for her? Just her beauty, you know, all her good understanding. And Pastor really brought out some awesome points um, and filled in any gaps that we left behind. And at the end of last week, I said, you know what, let's, um, let's give the sisters a way to study with us if they have the time or if they so desire. And let's give them a heads up from this point on. Um, and let, I'm sorry, I heard the uh, radio, so it, can, it, it stalled me just for a moment. But I said, let's tell each and every person that's listening a heads up. Let's come up with who we want to talk about a week in advance. And so I kind of, you know, that was new to Sister Jennifer. She she has something in mind. Sister Jennifer, do you remember what you said to the audience? Yes, ma'am. I said the woman of contention or the contentious woman. Right. And she said she doesn't really have a name, but I said that's right. perfect. I said let's, that's perfect. Let's go there. So we're talking about contention. So for those of you who are able to to sit down and grab your pins and really have your ears on tonight you will be blessed welcome sister lisa to the crew and sister angelica all four of us are crammed in the sound room and we are uh we're snug and we fit and we're all smiling uh sister angelica's waving to the the camera <laughs> hallelujah um let's talk about contention sisters let's talk about it any questions you may have concerning it anything that arises in your mind and i hope that if any of you are able to hear in the environment that you're in right now, maybe you're vacuuming, maybe you're washing dishes, maybe you're tending to your children and they're a little louder. I hope within the first 20 to 30 minutes that you'll really be able to sit yourself down and continue to listen to tonight's show because I have a really serious um, burning in my heart and expression that I want to express to you. For those of you who are few that will hear and hear the words and go forward with them, hallelujah for that. Um, Sister Jennifer, talk about your burning as well and open up tonight's show with contention, Sister. I'm I'm excited about what you may have to say. I have my pen ready, and I'm just as much a listener and learner as anyone that is listening tonight. Yes, ma'am. Well, you know, when we think about contention, I think a lot of times we think of a woman who is outwardly contentious. <clears throat> and when you look behind that word, contention, you see um, a woman who um, is brawling, who is argumentative. Um, you know, the word contention means discord, strife, disputation, disharmony. So when you think of that word, you think of a woman who is loud. You think of a woman who is just outwardly contentious. And But tonight, what's on my heart to deal with is the silent contention, the contention that we have in our minds. You know, I think that we are at a point where the devil is pretty wise. Um, and he knows that we're at a point where our men are to the point. They're getting to the point where they're really strong. And so he's not going to place um, a woman with outward contention um, in front of a strong Hebrew man because she's just not going to last. The contention that we are talking about tonight, the contention that's on my heart, is the contention that's silent, the contention that only you hear, but the contention that you... Um, show through your actions, the contention that speaks to you in your mind and you obey it and you have this soft, silent rebellion because you listen to this contention. So if we look at who is the contentious woman, who is she? Well, first of all, she's a prideful woman. She has no discretion. You know, we talked about Abigail last week and she was a woman of discretion. The contentious woman does not know how to tame her thoughts. She is foolish. Her husband really doesn't want to be around her because of her argumentative spirit. She nags constantly. You know, the Bible talks about or compares her nagging to a continual dripping of water. Her nagging is such that it's actually unbearable. It makes people not want to be around her. And, and the word torment kind of comes to my mind when I think of her, her nagging. Um, if you look in Proverbs, 27, 15, it says, a continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. So that leads me to believe that the nagging, I mean, if you hear a continual dropping of water, if you have a leak in your house and you're constantly hearing this water drop, eventually it's going to get to the point where it's, it's getting on your nerves. It's going to nag you. 
And I don't know if, if anyone is familiar with um, like Chinese water torture. It's an old form of, of torture that was used in Chinese prisons in the 1800s where water was slowly dripped onto a person's forehead. So, so Jennifer, we've lost you. We lost your words. I don't know if your, Can you hear me? your phone line <clears throat> is still up, my sister. So uh, move around. Can you hear me? Shalom. Thank you very much for a reconnect. Let's see. My sister. Sister. Shalom, can you hear me? Yes. Hallelujah, Sister okay. Jennifer. All right. I'm going to finish I'm my sorry. thought. And I'll, you know, you're fine. I'm going to finish my thought, and I want you to pick back up with the Chinese uh, waterboarding. Um, it looks like we got zeros from Sister Cheryl. Uh, can I get some? Okay, I got a 10 from Georgia Saints. Keep coming with the 10s and the zeros as we as we try to um, maintenance here. Anyone that has any tips for Sister Cheryl, please uh, share them out. Give them out. Uh, all right, Sister Cheryl's a 10. Hallelujah. Proverbs 21.9. I'm talking to all of you, each sister. That's what I was telling them, Sister Jennifer, right when you dropped off. We're talking to each one because we all have an idea in our minds of what we would believe contention is. So we automatically exclude ourselves from being that woman, and we read the scriptures as if the woman exists in our mind in a fairy tale, like far off, or we can see someone or picture someone, or maybe we can, oh, man, yeah, that sister, that's her. You know, that's how she is with her husband. No, actually, I'm talking to every single one of you. And for those of you who have mastered the meekness and the quietness that's required, I pray that you still get something out of tonight's show because it is, it's in all of us, all of us. We've been given, like Pastor said, a liberal mindset and too much liberty in this culture, and we have taken it and we ran with it. Proverbs 21.9 says, It's better to dwell on the corner of a rooftop, some translations say housetop, than with a brawling woman. Now, why would it say better to dwell on the corner of a rooftop or on top of a house than with a brawling woman? Because it, it's saying that to a man. Could you imagine the elements that you would be exposed to on the top of a roof? The rain, the snow, the sleet, the hail, the sun, the scorching. But with all the changes in the elements and all the changes in the weather, there's still more changes in you. There's still more changes in you and more or less, I should say, um, never being pleased. It's a never being pleased mentality. Nothing can make you happy. And that makes you more more um, or less determined like the weather. It makes you like the weather, like a continual drip. Sister Jennifer, pick up uh, where you left off, please. Yes, ma'am. I'm not sure how much you, you heard, but um, going back to talking about um, water torture. Um, it's an old form of torture used in Chinese prisons dating back to the late 1800s, where water was slowly dripped onto a person's forehead. And over time, this would begin to um, affect the person in a psychological way. So I think it's interesting that the Bible compares, you know, this dripping of the water to a contentious woman, how her nagging can be to the point where it can affect people psychologically it can affect her husband in such a negative way to where he doesn't even want to be around her um and so i think even that silent contention can still do the same thing if we're not careful you know it's not just the outward loud contention it's that silent contention that silent rebellion that we hold in our heart Yes, and we're we're definitely going to get there and we're going to expose silent rebellion tonight. And I hope for those who have the, the heart to change that you will receive it, see it in yourself, and go forward. That's what this is about. The mercy of Yah is to expose you and, and give you room for repentance. Proverbs twenty one nineteen says it's better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious woman. So it's better to be exposed to all the elements and all the beasts of the field and all the all the situations that may occur in the wilderness it's better to a man to be there than with a contentious woman or to be with some of us some of you um she talks about sister sister um jennifer keeps talking about the silent refusal to to submit you know the silent contention and that's what we can really bring out because you can actually have an outward form of yes sir and amen but your heart doesn't serve him when he's away from you if my husband or any of your husbands were were to give you a command, as small or as little as it may be, does it slip your mind? 
Does it slip your mind? Are you in complete servitude, even when he's away, that you would walk out his commands in your daily life? If something disturbs your husband, do you have that servitude in you to to change? Or do you have a justifiable way in you that you would, you know, go back and forth with him? Because contention is actually contending your carnal inclination, your carnal opinion, and it's actually your point or your way being argued. That's what it is, your way, right? And it's very carnal. It's a carnal nature to go back and forth, back and forth. And like Sister Jennifer has brought out, silent refusal to submit, silent contention. I believe we're beyond the outward expression of Jezebel. Like Pastor has said, you know, she is escaping, she's leaving this ministry. The outward Jezebel manifestation is leaving the ministry. But she is suppressing herself in some of us. And that's what we need to call out. That's what we need to to expose. Sister Jennifer said the word pride. It is a proud, proud way that we have in us to wish our husbands were different. Do you know that you actually don't have any option of leaving your husband outside of the Torah, of course, if he's not beating you, neglecting you, hurting you, physically abusing you, verbally abusing you. If he's under the law, all the nitpicky, naggy things that we may have to say about them is really carnal. And they're not going to be replaced in our life. I'm not going to just be taken out of my husband's life or him taken out of mine when we're under the law. So I need to learn how to truly get along with him and serve him to my utmost capacity. I should have nothing to say about his character. Zero. The only time that any of you should share any of your husband's character is only in a deliverance situation when you need freedom from something that binds you. We should never sit in the back corners or in the uh, wherever you may be, open or closed doors, speaking against our husbands in any way. We are no judges of their character, of their flaws, or of their flesh. We are to serve them and love them all the days of our life. Sister Jennifer, what say you? Yes, ma'am. I, I think, you know, you talked about contending, like contending for yourself, and I think we get that mixed up with, you know, when the Word tells us to contend for the faith. You know, when you contend for the faith, you're contending it's for Yah and his kingdom and his righteousness and his ways and his laws. But when you're just contentious, your contention is for yourself. It's selfish. You want to prove who you are. You want to prove that you're right. You want to prove that you have a point. And all you're proving is that you're prideful. So there's a difference. You know, when you're contending for the faith, you're focused on Yahweh. You're focused on his ways. You're focused on Israel. But when you're contentious, it's all selfish. Absolutely. James 4.1, let's go there. Uh, Sister Carolina here is working my e-sword to my right. James 4.1, I want us to really be able to see the true issue, the entire issue of our, of, of our walk. From this point forward, the issue is you. James 4.1 says, from which come wars and fightings from among you? Wars being contending in carnal inclinations. You can look that word up. It's executing your way. That's what a war is. So from whence come wars and fightings from among you? Come they not hence even of your own lust? Lust is what you long for. It's your desire. Some of us have a lust for contention. We wouldn't have it any other way unless we had the last say or if we had a, we had to add our words in. Um, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your own lust, that war in your members. Your war is in your members. Your problem is in you, my sisters. I often give, I give many sisters the same quote. You can, you can take it, coin the phrase, and take it, sisters. Apply it to every part of your walk. If nothing in your life changes, including your husband, your children, your environment, uh, the sister that you argue with, whatever form of contention that manifests itself in your life, if nothing changes around you, it's time for you to change. Because your change is what makes everything change. Because when you change, your perspective changes, you see things different, you respond differently, and you're not affected easily. 
so it's time for you to make a change. Sister Jennifer, anything on that note? Yes, ma'am. It's it's almost like we um, set ourselves up to blame everybody else. Oh, I'm in this situation, so I, I have to behave like this. Or, you know, I can't be delivered until this happens, until he does this. But it is on us. You know, we can't wait for someone else to change. And our point, our, our views are actually skewed when we don't have the right mindset. We're looking at everybody else and we're not looking at ourselves. So we don't have a pure eye. We, we have no idea how wicked our hearts are. But once we focus on ourselves and we start to change and the situation around us starts to change. Absolutely. Never forgiving, never forgetting forgiveness. Ecclesiasticus, because I got a few scriptures from there in our Apocrypha. Chapter 28. Chapter 28, verse 2 says, Forgive thy neighbor. It also would mean forgive thy husband, forgive thy children, forgive thy pastor, forgive thy elder, whatever, whoever. You know, put names in there. Forgive thy neighbor the hurt that he hath done unto thee, so shall thy sins also be forgiven when thou prayest. One man beareth hatred against another, and doth he seek pardon from Yahweh? So one man beareth hatred against another, but he's seeking pardon and forgiveness from Yeshua. It's not going to happen. Over in verse 28, chapter 28, verse, I'm sorry, verse 8, chapter 28, verse 8, it says, Abstain from strife, and thou shalt diminish thy sins. Keyword, thy sins. Abstain from strife, sisters, and thou shalt diminish thy sins. If you abstain yourself from strife and from contention, you will automatically lessen your sins and lessen the reason to repent. So I got so many notes and so many things going in my mind that it's hard to kind of hone it in tonight because this is a really awesome topic. I actually come from experience tonight. I spoke last week and told you all. I don't come from experience when it when it comes to, you know, living with an unbelieving husband, you know, when we talked about Abigail. But I come from much experience in the realm of contention. And a lot of us, if you're anything like me, who we hang hang out with and hung out with and who molded and shaped and developed us into characters, you know, I hung out with a lot of ethnic uh people, a lot of, you know, people who were of different colors and different backgrounds from different countries. You know, I, I went to colleges where I was actually minority. You know, white white people are minority in some colleges, and I, I attended those. So you pick up on a lot of natures. And so we actually learned. My mind was molded and trained to kind of one-up each other. You know, you're playing around and you're being foolish, so you're automatically thinking quicker than the next guy. You know, and they're slinging something at you, and you're slinging at them, and it's fun and games, and you come into the faith, and here you are. Here's your character. Here's your nature. No matter what your reason or why it was molded and who you are, no matter your husband's background or your background, you're still, you're still, your behavior is now put to the test. So we have to make some some quick decisions. We have to change a lot of things. Sister Jennifer, I want to go kind of a different route, but I'm not sure that we're done with this. So I want you to continue to speak everything that's on your mind in the in the form of contention, so that I don't, you know, veer off course. Please. I just wanted to read one scripture from Proverbs that matches up with the scripture you just read in Ecclesiasticus um, 28, verse 8. But it's Proverbs 17, 14. And it says, The beginning of strife is as when one letteth out water. Therefore, leave off contention before it be meddled with. So we have a choice. We can either choose to listen to the contention in our mind, you know, just like you can choose to let out water. You can choose to leave the contention alone. Don't meddle with it. The beginning of strife is as when one letteth out water. Therefore, leave off contention before it be meddled with. So I just thought that matched up very nicely with um, the Apocrypha, so I just wanted to share that. Yes, uh, Ecclesiast- Ecclesiasticus in the Apocrypha, sticking with chapter uh, 28, Going over to verse 11, says, A hasty contention kindles a fire, and a hasty fighting sheds blood. If thou blow the spark, it shall burn. If thou spit upon it, it shall be quenched, and both these come out of the mouth. 
we have the ability as women to blow the spark. Blow the spark. Some of us, it's become such a mannerism. We we know exactly what buttons to push in our husbands, and we and we really tap it into the realm of witchcraft when we don't mind seeing his emotions fluctuate. We don't mind upsetting him. We don't uh, we don't have any fear. You know, Eve didn't really think about the consequences she would have in biting the apple. And there's multiple situations throughout the word that that women didn't really think about the circumstance or the situation that might come after them. We don't have the fear that should be upon us in chase conversation. Likewise, you wives, 1 Peter 3, 1, be in subjection to your own husbands that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. That is the absolute opposite opposite of contention a chaste conversation coupled with fear if we actually had the fear upon us that we desire that we long for that we need in this late hour if we had that fear it would tame our tongues because if it's left up to us we we can't no man can tame their tongue you have to cry out to yah for help you know, contention is something that you can su- you can suppress contention and continue to walk in silent contention all the days of your life and feel liberated while doing so. Or you can actually suppress contention with a righteous heart and righteous spirit and watch Yah change you. You can suppress your contention to the point where it's no longer a part of you. It doesn't even come up out of you or in you that you are completely submitted and in subjection to your own husband, whether he's around you giving you a command, or whether he's gone. Your whole object is to serve him like unto the Messiah, for it's the only way you can show the Father that you love him, that you would do unto your husband, unto your neighbor, as you would him. 33.4, let's go, Ecclesiastes chapter 33, verse 4. Let me flip there because I got my apocrypha out. Ecclesiastes 33, Verse four for me and for me and Sister Nellie, this is our this is our book, our apocrypha. You know, many of us. I could probably name all of you in the chat room too. You love this book, I know you do. Chapter thirty three, verse four. Prepare what to say, prepare what to say, and so thou shalt be heard. And bind up instruction, and then make an answer. So if you prepare what to say, controlled speech. You know, we can have that. You can actually meditate on how to conversate with people when you're not around them. You can actually, let's use this word. You know, when you sit down with a lot of people in deliverance, you know, we have a lot of, uh, we have trigger words, women do, that if you speak that trigger word, it'll set me off. You know, all you got to do is say the right thing and boom, I'm in the, I'm in the spirit. You know, I'm heavy. I'm depressed. Why? Because you said that trigger word. You know, yeah. my husband said that trigger word. Or uh, we, we need to know those trigger words about ourselves. The word that just sends us spiraling out of the joy and the peace of the spirit. So, Sister Caroline is over here. Ooh, good one. Because we all understand. We understand the speech. But we need to we need to really hone in on those trigger words. We need to understand the lies of the enemy and how he works in our heart. We need to get rid of those trigger words so that we don't have the same responses. And a lot of times we'll push them to the back of our minds. You know, we'll push the trigger word that has upset me to the back of my mind and push my manifestation to the front, drag my countenance down, control the environment around me, control the household that I'm in or the sisters around me or the husband that's with me, making sure that everyone knows I'm feeling a certain way because you need to feel it too. We know exactly what I'm talking about. But we don't focus on what just made us spiral out of the spirit, the ruah, the joy and the peace that we had, and into the heaviness that we're now walking in. So write that down, trigger words, focus on that. But let's go back to meditation for a moment because you can actually, you should know, you know, getting into a marriage as you learn someone that you may be marrying or as you develop in years of maturity in marriage, you should know what upsets them. You should know how to communicate in order to blow or, what does the word say, 
spit on the flame. You should be able to spit on the flame. That's the that's what we want in us instead of the ability and the strength that we've always had, which is to blow, to blow on the spark, to make it ignite, to say the words that would make someone around us feel the way we feel, or worse, make a contentious, you know, a contentious argument or prove our point. We want to become masters at blowing on the spark. Quick to hear, slow to wrath, slow to speak. Sister Jennifer, anything? Yes, ma'am. When you think about Abigail, you know, we talked about Abigail last week. <clears throat> she had prepared what to say. You know, she didn't just run, um, run up with loose lips. You know, she had in her heart prepared already what to say. And so I I think it's just really good when you're looking at the woman of contention to reflect on the woman of understanding, to reflect on Abigail. You know, you see the contrast, and so we have the two examples before us, and so we want to be like the woman of understanding. Absolutely, and you, you used it so much last week when we spoke of Abigail, the word discretion, Ecclesiastic. Ecclesiasticus, I'm going to get it right, Apocrypha, staying in uh, chapter 33, going over to verse 29. But be not excessive towards any, and without discretion do nothing. Without discretion do nothing. Same chapter, verse 29. I'm sorry, I just read that. Be not excessive towards any. I have, uh, I have the word carefulness come into my mind, because we actually don't, we don't walk in carefulness. You know, we don't walk in carefulness towards towards um, our husbands, towards the people around us. We don't walk as if the thing that I might say or do might control someone or control the situation. We don't act as if a judgment or, um, you know, a response from the Father would come. We, we, we don't. Does that make sense, Sister Jennifer? Help me out. Carefulness yes, is. Ma'am. Go ahead, please. It's controlling your emotions, you know, learning how to um, control yourself, to control your, I mean, we always say it, women, we are emotional and we need to learn how to control our emotions and not be excessive. So that's what I think about, um, you know, when I look at this, to not be excessive toward any. Well, don't be excessive in your emotions. Learn how to control yourself. Learn how to be um, temperate. Yes, temperate, temperate, and and learn when you are provoking. You know, we can provoke to good works. You know, Sister Angelica and Sister Tama can come on the land and do a really great job, and and we can reflect and see areas that we need to uh, look at them and and come up in. Uh, I'm just saying those two because they're the latest additions to moving here physically as sisters. We can look at each other and be provoked to good works. We can see things in others without any envy or strife or wrath or jealousy in us at all and just say, wow, she does such an awesome job. You know, Sister Nellie is a very, very clean individual. She does a really good job cleaning things when she when she cleans rooms or, or after she's cooked or whatever, and that's an area that I really came up in. I can't say I left anything ever nasty, but she cleans so well as she goes through a process that I really I, I tried to do the same. You can You can be provoked to good works, but you also can provoke or influence your own husband towards someone else to liken their minds and their opinions to what yours is. We have the potential in us through contentious arguments or just that silent contention to slip our ideas and our opinions in and really counsel our husbands, and that is such a no-no. It ought not to be. So anything that you have in your mind towards someone, walk in carefulness when you're even speaking uh, to your husband or in deliverance about a situation because ultimately you want to keep the humility about yourself that you're wrong, that your opinion is wrong, especially if it's something of a negative sort. So you actually want to provoke your husband's judgment upon your wickedness, not provoke his judgment to agree with you. Um, there's a, a, a particular Athelia, you know, she was a really wicked counselor for her son. She counseled him to wickedness. And um, that's, you know, it's, it's a really small portion of the scriptures or of the Bible, so it's really not worth bringing out tonight as far as reading in context because, you know, it's just a few, few short scriptures on her. But she counseled 
to do wicked and counseled in her way. And that means to basically advise or guide or deliberate or exchange ideas. That's something that we shouldn't do. If your husband wants to include you in an idea or ask your opinion, by no means are you out of, um, out of order in responding to him. That's the time to express any and everything because he's open to it. But please walk with the carefulness, uh, knowing your own self and knowing the deceitfulness of your heart, that you're not trying to advise him to to agree with you. Anything, Sister Jennifer? Yes, ma'am, that's a great point. You know, wait until you're asked. Um, a lot of times we want to give opinions and, and we want to say it in, in our soft voice, in our, our sweet tone, you know, but our opinion really wasn't even asked for. So wait until you're asked. And then... You know, if you see something that you would like to discuss with your husband, ask the father for an opportunity. I know for me, every time I ask the father for an opportunity to discuss anything, I always get it if it's his will. And so if you wait for the opportunity, wait until you're asked, then the father will make sure that everybody's hearts are right and he'll make sure that the points come out that need to come out and there's actually fruit that will be shown from that when everything is in order and when you use discretion and you seek Yahweh. Hallelujah. Good words. I, I kind of want to change gears like I, like I mentioned earlier, and I don't ever want any of you tonight sisters, to forget that word contention because that is our focus. I usually sit down at some point during the week and try to write um, maybe my thoughts or some scriptures to kind of give me some form of a guidance, um, you know, for the show and this particular week was very, very different. I can't really understand on an elder's perspective or a pastor's perspective by any means, nor ever will I desire to understand what it's like to be fed, you know, by Yahweh, fed a message that you have to get out to the people, that you have to, you know, shout, uh, cry loud, spare not. You know, I don't, I'm not even in the capacity to understand that. But with this particular show... And I hope you all are sitting down from this point on. That's not mandatory. I just want you to really get a seriousness in you from this point on in your walk, starting on tonight's show. Because I sat down trying to understand uh, contention, trying to get a direction, you know, in the word. And and I'm building on a story on purpose, and I'm using this story to kind of fill the gaps in, in our understanding and get you all on board with what I'm, why I might be seeming like I'm changing subjects, because I'm not. I actually got this burning in me to express to you all the change that's coming. And a lot of us can only fathom what change it may be. And I'm talking about in the environment around us, and I'm talking about in this world as we know it. You can hear the man of Yah expressing it in the best way that he knows how, with all passion, boots I mean, I mean, just everything, boots on the ground, loins girded up, shield of faith. He's got it all. He's ready. He's trying to prepare us. And he's hearing directly from the spirit that is holy. And as I sat down to focus on contention, what burned in my spirit was, and here it goes, we know that a wise woman builds her house and a foolish one plucks it down. And I want you all to, to know Are you serious? Are you serious about this walk? Are you serious about serving Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, the soon coming King? You need to know if you're serious. And you need to know if you're not. Because some of you aren't serious. And we are deceived believing that we are serious. Because you have a house. First of all, the first house being the temple that the Ruah lives and dwells in, which is your body. And you have a home. A house that is a physical place that you dwell. And that dwelling place has a spirit about it. Whether the peace of the Ruah lives and abides there or contention. The spirit of your home is so important going into the change that we are about to experience. I know not whether it be 10, 15, 20 years away. I know not if it's three. But I'm going to paint a scenario for all of you. Because the question really is, not how, you know, pastor does an awesome job 
getting us naturally ready. He tells you to stock silver. He tells you to stock food. Go out and grab lentils here and there, little small cans here and there. He tells you the natural. And by no means is this a fear message, so don't misperceive it, sisters. I don't think you will. He tells us how to naturally prepare. For those of us who may not have finances, number one, our goal may be, you know what, I'm trying to come out of her. I need to focus on getting out of this place or moving this location. You know, I know that you have a focus. I know that you have a spirit that is leading you just like the spirit that's leading me. But the, but the, the way that this burning came to me lets me know the time that we're in. If I had never known it before until tonight's show, I know it now. There is an environmental change that is coming about that will change everything you've ever known around you, whether you believe it or not, and most of us do. The mark of the beast will come. But let's, let's paint this scenario, Sister Jennifer, that each and every one of us will never, ever hear each other's voice again. That this is the last show you'll ever hear, and I'm not talking about uh, make sure you got silver, make sure you got oil for your, your lamps, make sure you got food. I'm not. That's not the message tonight. What have you spiritually done to prepare your home? Because you are responsible for you, yourself, your own spirit, and your children. That is your responsibility, and that's what you will answer for. We have a natural response that's built inside of us called fear. And that natural response of fear will be present when uh, Pastor did a video, you know, sometime back, not even, you know, within this past month. Could you imagine the mayhem and the chaos that would break out in, what was it, Atlanta? I think he said, if a nuclear blast was predicted to happen in two hours. Could you imagine what would happen in the hearts of each of us if I came on here tonight and said, in two hours, in two hours, all electricity will be pulled from this land. There will be no communication coming in or going out. All you have is who you have built relationships with as of right now. You will not have your phone to call any saint. You will have only your husband and your children. And if you're alone, I pray that you have Yah. Lights out. Money's gone. Money's changed. All the food you have is in your house. Blog talking online is gone. YouTube is gone. Home raiders are out. Looters are out. Mark of the Beast is here. Whatever you can paint in your mind to really get this perspective. What have you done to spiritually get yourself ready for a relationship with the king? Because the contention that you may have silently is a mock at Yah. He says that he will mock Proverbs 126, I also will laugh at your calamity and I will mock when your fear comes. The deceit is that the the believing that you will have the ability to submit when a change comes, that's deceit, sisters. The deceit is believing that we will automatically be ready because, like Pastor says, nothing's going to get us ready like tribulation. The suffering we're going through now is not getting us ready like tribulation. I'm excited, but I'm very fearful. For for the day of Yahweh is a great and terrible day. It's a very fearful thing. But we don't know how many years or months or weeks, days, that we may have to dwell inside of the home that we're in right now. Sister Jennifer, before I go on, what say you? I think you're right on. Um, You know, we have a lot of work to do with our relationship with Yah, and I'm I'm speaking to all the sisters, especially when, you know, we talk about um, the last Passover and the lack of sobriety, um, you know, even during the feast, even during, um, you know, the taking of the bread and receiving the blood, you know, the the lack of focus that was there. it really should be an intimate time. And for us to not have that intimacy really speaks to our relationship with Yah. And so we have a lot of work to do. We really do. The the silent contention that we may hold in our hearts is a reflection of the contention that we have with Yah. And so, you know, like Sister Ashley said, if we're not ready, you won't be ready just at the flip of a switch. It's not going to happen. He's going to mock you if you're not ready 
if you have silent contention in your heart that's not dealt with, when that time happens, the murmuring will start, the complaining will start, and you're going to spread a toxic environment for everyone, which will not be good. Absolutely. And and going back to what I was saying earlier with the, the, the natural response of fear that we have, you know how many of us are actually, or, or ask yourself this, because that's what this program is about. It's a mirror to yourself, you know, because we speak, Sister Jennifer and I speak, not having anyone in our hearts and our minds. We truly are empty vessels, so we just want, you know, we ask that the Holy Spirit just use us in any way. And and we all know what it's like to have that natural response of fear, you know, and your children have natural responses of fear as well, whether they're, they're very small and they fall or or they're much older and they see blood. You know, there's that natural response in us to fear. And I want you all to really reflect on your attitudes, your actions, and your responses towards things and, and how, how much panic and fear may be in you, how quick you are to really express everything that's inside of you. There's an internal calmness and an internal, uh, what would it be called, just an internal silence that you can attain in this walk that's really going to be imperative for the time that we're going in. I give I give two two natural examples come to my mind and please the phone lines are are still open sisters call in any time for questions or whatever you may have on your heart. You know we had a flood hit, um, and I hadn't been I hadn't been at Straightway many years. I don't remember exactly when it was or how many years ago it was, but I I I consider myself still a babe. You know, I'm still a child in the faith. And it began to rain and rain and rain, and within a 24-hour span, we had, I think it was 14 inches of rain, which living beside of a creek will cause uh, creek lines to go up. And, and the creek was raging like a river. There was cows going down the, river, the, the, the creek. Well, not ours, but, you know, neighbor's cows. There were, you know, huge trees and large floating items that were literally rushing down this river that if you were even caught in our creek, you would be gone. There'd be no way of saving you, and I mean that. We had fence posts in our what we call the back 40 because it's actually the back of our property, and the fence posts that are, you know, I don't know, five feet high, four and a half, or whatever you want to guess, was completely submerged in water. We went into a schoolhouse to pick up it was it was a group of us i know sister vicky was with me um brother shane i think was kind of leading the pack but we were trying to go into the school to save some of the things that were going to get damaged in the water because this water it came out of nowhere saints it really did it just kept raining we had no idea it was going to be this bad and if you're anything like me and you don't really pay attention to the weather everything in the weather is a surprise so we we go into the schoolhouse and you know, the water is rising through the floor, and even walking into the school, the water was hitting my knees, and at some points my thighs, and I'm, you know, I'm taller, so that's a lot of water, it's feet and feet and feet of water, it was coming up in the bottom of Brother Shane's home, you know, touching the carpet in the bottom of his trailer, and his trailer is up rather high, so if you could just, you know, imagine the, the, the form of panic that you could have, now, panic's not going to stop the rain, and I didn't have any panic on me. I'm just giving this natural natural example. So we were going into the school, and we were lifting up everything off of the floor that would be damaged. There were some speakers and things of value that belonged, you know, in the tabernacle um, that we were lifting up, and we were placing on top of tables. The tables were, you know, three feet high or just your normal table height or whatever. We're walking out of the schoolhouse after we had finished and the rain is still pouring, and the creek is still raging, so it causes a really loud, natural sound just to have the the elements poured forth like that. And for those of you who have been on the land, we're back by Brother Shane's house, and I hear a a loud noise of of a man, you know, screaming for help. And so we all take off running, and I had a natural response of fear on my heart so heavy to get to wherever this noise what what is going on what is this you know what is this and i thank y'all for moments like that because you want to know you want to know how you're going to respond and i get to the you know to the front and pastor's taking care of it you know um brother rich is having a hard time with a bull who has actually you know took his horns and rammed him in the thigh 
he was hit by a bull in the middle of this flood, and so he was in a lot of pain, and it was none of our sister's business to be anywhere close, so we, we left. We went away. Another another um, story that comes to my mind, and I'm, I'm getting to something because we, we don't know how we're going to respond. You know, we had a tornado hit here, and we left Bible study one night not knowing the weather and not knowing that a tornado was even coming. So I went down to the dining hall, and I wasn't living on the land yet. I was simply just visiting. So I would travel from one-hour location every time we had Bible study. So I'm down in the, the dining hall, and I'm just eating, you know, late-night meal. And I hear the, the sound of the train. There's no train around here, mind you, because if you've ever heard a tornado, it does sound exactly like a train. And the suction of the building got so tight that the doors wouldn't open and the windows wouldn't open. And so I thought to myself, okay, this is this is a tornado. And I had a natural response of fear. Because I'm in the building. Brother Doug was there. I think one other individual. It's after Bible study. It's late. It's dark. And I don't know where all the other saints are. I was at that moment young in the faith as a, as a babe wishing that they were all in the dining hall with me. Because I could feel the presence of fear really strong not knowing what was going to happen. And obviously we were saved from both of those natural disasters. But do you know what form of panic that you have as a sister? I've seen panic in sisters and fear in sisters that is just unparalleled and unnecessary, honestly. Uh, When we call on Yah and we believe in Yah, we have to lay that fear aside. And I know it takes some time to really change natures within us, but from this point, Point on, and I'm serious, sisters, get the message tonight that we, l- we need to learn how to respond so that we can actually benefit our household and not cause a, a bad negative vibe because your children will be influenced by your responses to everything, everything that is in you they will follow. Can you calm your house? When daddy says, I'll be back, I'm gone to get food, and you haven't seen him in seven days, he was supposed to be back the night that he left. Now you have a house of children, whether one, two, or three, daddy's gone, and you don't have the food that he said he was coming back for. Can you calm your house? Because we panic over the slightest things. After we had that tornado, which greatly damaged this town, we would often have, uh, if you want to call it tornado drills, not really. But we have some very strong built homes on the land. So oftentimes there will be a, you know, hey, here comes a tornado. Saints get to the closest concrete building. You know, and Sister Barb lived on the hill at the time. She would come to the tabernacle where she would dwell in safe, safety. Um, those who were at the front end of the land, you know, could go to the dining hall. Those at the back end of the land could go to Pastor Dow's home. And uh, now we're getting more homes that are built more solid, so we have a lot more places um, to go. I've been underneath my house in really bad storms um, just in the past couple of years because we've been through a tornado. So we would be fools to think it couldn't happen again um, because it really destroyed this town. What I'm getting to is with this natural disaster stuff and the panic that we can have, I've actually witnessed saints, and it's always sisters. It's always sisters get into the dining hall in a time of sobriety and sister vicky if you're listening i know you're smiling i know you're laughing because she often sat with me as we would sit there calmly waiting for the storm to hit or go away and just watch spirits manifest a lot of those spirits aren't even here now but the fear that will overcome you even just in a natural way Like Pastor talks about the natural fear every time he jumped out of an airplane. It's there. It's present. But you push past it. That's the strength that you have to have in the days that are coming ahead. And the easy contending that we have, the easy provoking and initiating and pushing buttons, and whether it be silent contention, um, our responses are so openly manifest at this moment right now. How do we think for a minute or a moment that we can contain ourselves in a time of panic? And I actually had this laid on my heart. I say the word heavy. It's not a heaviness. It's a burning. I had it laid on my heart before Baltimore. I didn't even know Baltimore Baltimore was going on. Now, at, at my knowledge now, I can see what's going on in Baltimore. I can see that, wow, 
these individuals, some of them, I'm sure, it doesn't show the side of the city that the people can't come out of their homes for fear, that they can't travel to the stores at night for fear, they can't send their children out of their homes. How would your children do inside a home day in and day out for the next seven years when when martial law is in play or cannibalism is happening right down the street? Or, or just any, any worst-case scenario you can paint in your mind, we have to get our homes built on wisdom. We have to get our children out of panic situation. We have to calm them. We don't, we don't um, you know, coddle them when they're panicking, when they're having fits, even when you're giving them the rod in the simplest form and they're having a fit and a panic. You should have the ability to always spit on the flame. Sister Jennifer, please say something. Yes, ma'am, you know, you think about Abigail <clears throat> from last week, and you think about um, how she reacted. Abigail did not have an action of fear. You know, she went ahead and she moved. She got everything together, loaves of bread, bottles of wine, sheep, um, corn, raisins, figs. She moved. She wasn't paralyzed by fear. And so I, I really think that we can learn a lot from that, you know, we can't um, be the way that the world is. The world is supposed to be fearful, but we have, yeah, and I, I know something that helped me to deal with fear was um pastor was um, speaking, and I don't know if it was scripture study but or, or one of his videos, but, you know, he said, in your mind, you have to know that death is going to happen, but you just have to understand that you have to die honorably. So we can't be fearful. I mean, we're going to, we're going to die. We are. Death is going to happen. And so I think if you have that in your mind, I mean, and if you've lived the right life, you're going to see the king. I mean, what better way than to die an honorable death and to see the king? Absolutely. The environment around us will bring contention more so where you may be than where I am. We have yet to see any changes uh, in the environment physically and naturally around us like many of you. We don't know what it's like. As Toma tells the story, when the army tanks travel down African streets, you don't run to them. You run to the village and you get there quick and you get out of the city. Why? Because they learn from their experience at war early on. This society is ignorant, completely blinded to what may ever happen, and it's coming. And Yah will mock this country. But we have to have such an inner peace about us that we have the ability to calm our own spirits, rely upon Yah and have a relationship with Him, and not have fear of not having associations with the saints again or fear of not seeing uh, husband, children again. We have to get, if I can use the word isolated in a pure sense, isolated towards the Father, just you and Him, that if anything around you, and you need to, uh, let's go, let's go there. Let's go to my mind, and I know Sister Nelly, I've used her a couple times tonight because I know she loves this as well. Second Maccabees chapter 7, let's go there. Let's talk about this woman for a moment. Many of you who've read this story, you know exactly what I'm, what I'm about to say. We're going to read it as if it's live, though. Never forgetting contention, though. Because if contention is the nature in us now, it will be in us when temptation around us arises. Because, you know, for many of us that have worked out in the world and you come home and it takes you like an hour, hour and a half to wind down from all the anxiety of the job, you know, all the heaviness, like Pastor says, you know, serving them with them Gentiles, it's, it's heavy. How long it even takes you to come out of that environment and get to your house, get settled in, not easily frustrated by your children and everything that's happening in your home because you're trying to wind down. You know, and you're in your selfish mode, you just want to relax and get to yourself when really you need to build up your house, regardless of what you may feel or what you may have just come from. You need to tend to your home because that is where the Spirit of Yah dwells. Let's go Second Maccabees chapter 7 and read about what this woman, how she had trained her children in such a manner to respond like this. Second Maccabees chapter 7, it came to pass also that seven brethren with their mother were taken and compelled by the king against the law to taste swine's flesh and when they were tormented with scourges and whips 
stop there and consider. Let's let's pick a sister, Sister Jennifer. Say us. Hold on, hold on. I'm sorry, we have a caller, and I don't want to ignore this caller before I get on my rant about this chapter because I love it so much. Give me just a moment. Sister Jennifer, be thinking of a sister that we want to use, a name that you want to use in place of this woman in Chapter 7 uh, with children so that we can paint a real live picture. We're going to area code 281. 281. Can you hear me? Shalom, shalom. How are you today? Wait. Shalom. Bless you, Sister Tiffany. Bless you. Shalom. Shalom. <laughs> um, uh, I, I I almost wanted you to finish what you were saying before you called me on. <laughs> oh, please. It's okay. I oh, might be on it for a minute. I was, so <laughs> <laughs> I was so intrigued by what you were saying. Um, I had I had two comments. Um uh, and and one of them is is um, a little off topic, and one of them is actually a little on topic. Um, from what you were saying, um, so I guess I will I will go on topic first. Um, uh, uh, I'll think about what you were talking about and how you will react. And um, just recently, I, I had um, gone through some physical. Um, things uh, that um, I actually knew ahead of time about because of you. Um, Y'all bless me (laughs) to be able to have this conversation with you, and I I really appreciate your simple words um, that you said. Um, But I was thinking about what you all are talking about and the contentiousness and being prepared um, for those things, and uh, it reminded me of uh, when I was going through different episodes with my body where my body um, was actually um, breaking down or having um, its breakdown moment. And uh, in it, I would have, um, I would break out in hives. And I don't know if anyone has ever had that instance where they break out in hives, but my hives are very painful, very painful. Um, to the point of where I would almost pass out from the level of pain (laughs) that it would have in me. And um, I remember the first episode of it happening, and um, as it happened, um, and and I'm sorry, this is just my uh, testimony. I just wanted to give a piece of it. Um, But as it would happen, the first time that it happened, it was um, so fast. So so intense uh, that my husband would just um, started to play praise music in the household, so that my anxiety level would come down, um, and it would because of the level of intensity of it. Um, and I only believed in trying to cure it naturally. I didn't want to try to cure it any other way, and um, I would have a high breakout over my whole body. Um, legs, arms, uh, and if you understand, hives are a, um, it's an allergic reaction to something that's going on in your body, uh, and your whole body breaks out and these wet, and they itch really, really bad, um, and if you scratch, the pain intensifies by, you know, uh, every time that you scratch, the pain intensifies. So you cannot scratch, but your whole body itches. Um, and um, so it was so painful for me, and that I would uh, that I would almost pass out in that level of pain. And um, so it happened more than once. The episode happened more than once. The first time that it happened, my husband played, and through his playing, it calmed me down um, to be able to go through it to the level of where I put the chickweed and the. Um, ginger on and I took the ginger and I took uh, the nettle uh, that I was able to calm down enough to where it would um, calm the histamine in my body to where I would not um, be fearful in my reaction. Uh, But it happened more than once. It was something that happened to me more than once. And the first time it happened, uh, I didn't know what was going on. So my body reacted in fear. Uh, to the point where I just had to lay and, and pray to the Father. Um, and then the second time, 
that it happened, um, that that's when the fear came upon me because I knew exactly what was about to happen to me. And um, knowing the level of pain that, that was going to happen to me um, struck a fear in me because I knew what was going on and I knew the level of, of pain that I was going to be in. And um, so by the second time, I had a choice. Either I could react um, in fear or I could react in the peace that I felt in my spirit at that time. And um, the first time, I I have to be honest, the the second time that it happened to me, there was a fear uh, in my reaction. And um, it, it was so intense that I just passed out. You know, um, and then the the second time or the time that it, it happened again, I saw it coming upon me again. I reacted differently. I reacted in prayer and praise. And because of my reaction in prayer and praise, uh, it was it was a light thing that happened to me, and it lightened up the pain. Now, the pain was still there, but because of my reaction, uh, it had a different effect on my body, and my body was able to endure through it. And so I think about as you're talking um, and you're talking about how do we react in those situations, uh, it really brought a natural um, understanding to me as I understood how in my own body when those things arose, how I was um, able to endure and how y'all were kind of um, taught me how to endure. Um, Absolutely. It sounds like a beautiful testimony, and you're you're thinking right on point, right on point. Very good understanding of tonight's show, and you have you learned from the first occasion, and you're able to grow forward because you still had to maintain your duties as a mother and all the things you had in your life as you maintained this natural um, affliction. So very, very good testimony. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Um, it, and it, it's a blessing from y'all. Uh, because we we really don't know how we're going to respond, and we really don't know, uh, and we really have to learn how to understand how we'll respond like you're talking. So you're blessing, definitely blessing me with your uh, with your topic tonight, and it is it is putting a mirror before my face and really um, teaching me to uh, look at myself as I as as we go through this situation. How do we react? Do we overreact um, as when well we can do that? Um, the second thing that I wanted to discuss, um, just kind of as the um, broadcast came on, I was listening to um, Pastor Dow when he did his broadcast, and I was truly, truly um, blessed by um, Mother Bullock and her testimony uh, when she came on and she talked about how she was a pastor, and from her being a pastor, she humbled herself um, and became a daughter of Zion. And uh, I was way, really, Elohim really moved said, It is not good moment. for the man uh, to be alone. I, I am to, going to make a helper uh, for him as his Hallelujah. counterpart. Her testimony really moved me and really affected me. Uh, it was truly, truly a blessing to my spirit uh, in the way that she just uh, showed how humbling herself and understanding uh, her role um, really um, put her in a place of being seen as a great value in the eyes of Yahweh. Uh, it, it, it is a blessing. It is a blessing to have mothers like that in Zion who uh, humble themselves uh, in the eyes of Yahweh and show us how to humble ourselves. It is definitely a rarity now to be able to see uh, these mothers, and it's a blessing because we don't see it very often. I think about the realm in which I came from, and I came from a strong uh, Christian background um, where I was really into it, uh, dedicated into it, and I saw the women in their role, in their Jezebel, in their full peacock glory. Um, I was taught how to be that, how to always have where I always have something to say, always be contentious as you're talking about tonight. Um, and it was 
it was something that was tried to be embedded in me, uh, and it was something that I endured through with a lot of women. And to hear a woman of Yah be able to say, I knew that it was something wrong with that. And to be elevated to the level that she was at and to say she humbled herself even in the midst of it because her love of Yah overtook her beyond anything that she was doing and beyond anything that was going on at that time. And then she humbled herself because her level was truly, truly a blessing to me. And it was an example of how we really have to be. Our love for Yah has to overcome anything else that's in our lives, anything, uh, when it comes down to it. And to hear her talk about how it humbled herself was a blessing to me. And that's all I, I have to say. <laughs> Thank you so today, much. I just wanted her to know that. Yes, I I don't want much time to ever go by that we have waited too long to mention Mother Bullock's name. And for those sisters who have never had a mother, you even in the natural, you know how lacking you are, how much hell you have to wade through and go through just to try to make up the hedge uh, for, for having that absence, you know, in your life. And even the much more so spiritually if we could all on the count of three say we need you one two three we need you you. hallelujah mother bullock we we need you and i think she has a very very good understanding of that and i and i last when i I ran to hug her as she was leaving in the truck because i really wanted to sit down with her this time when she came obviously it didn't work out she was always sitting with someone um and I'm not priority by any means. I didn't have anything meaningful to even say. I just wanted to hear uh, from her. But I ran to her, her truck just to hug her and say, Mom, please, and if you're listening tonight, please call in and rebuke us, edify us, encourage us, uplift us, anything that God will ever lays on your heart for the sisters. This is an open doorway for it. We will always hopefully receive it and sit back in humility and listen to your words, Mother. We love you. Thank you, Sister oh. Tiffany, for not letting her words be forgotten. Bless you, Sister. Bless you, bless you. Thank you all. And um, just be encouraged and continue on with this because it is truly a blessing um, to me and it's a blessing um, I know from from people that I talk to. So please, please, please continue on in the work that you are doing for Yahweh and um, be blessed. Hallelujah. And um, Hallelujah. Talk to you, love you. <laughs> oh, love you too. Shalom. And from you, Sister Jennifer, anything? Shalom, bless you, and we just we rejoice in your healing. We rejoice in your overcoming, and thank you so much for sharing that with us. Shalom. 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 Hallelujah. Beautiful call. Anyone else from this moment on, please feel free. Uh, 41 minutes left in the show. Thank you all for still listening. 54, 54 listeners tonight. Um, our numbers keep growing, just a few, you know, at a time. And a lot of people, um, shout out to, I know, Brother Jermaine is obviously not going to listen to the show, and if he if he is, by all means, he's welcome um, to be edified for any any reason. But I, he called my husband and I this week um, to give us the good news that he was putting the broadcast onto the Straightway Help Meets page on YouTube, and I really appreciate that. Um, any anyone have anything for Straightway Help Meets? Please continue to do it, produce it, upload it, put it out there. Uh, I, I had said this earlier in times past that you know the turkey butchering that Sister Candace did is now at eight thousand views, which is crazy. But if you type in turkey butchering, no one's got a tur- turkey butchering video, so that's pretty cool. It's ways that you, we may be fishers for the men because they're fishing for Yahweh. So uh, hopefully our YouTube channel will continue to help out. Sister Angelica um, did a, did a uh, per- what do you call it, participation, precipitation, precipitation. She's smiling at me. What was your class called? It was just the water cycle. <laughs> the water cycle. You're so cute. She's a beautiful, beautiful lady. Water cycle. I uploaded that video. And Sister Rachel did a phenomenal job last first day I was so excited to sit through her class. The children were really into it, and you'll see her class um, coming up on our on our Help Meets page, and I hope that all of y'all are being edified. And and forgive me for any errors in the filming because I might have, you know, Zephan on my hip or Judith on my leg or 
Eliana wanting me. You know, there's a lot going on when you're, you know, when I hear you, Lisa. She's laughing over here, but uh, there's a lot going on when we're trying to film, and and then and then when it gets to the editing part, Josh is always reminding me, please zoom out a little when you're filming something because his his uh, editing in his computer cuts off people's heads. Uh, so bless y'all for for watching. And um, I even had Sister Shan, beautiful Sister Shan. Her and her husband were with us during the feast, and they were beautiful uh, house guests. And she called me encouraging me yesterday, and. Uh, she 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 really was thankful for what Brother Jermaine is doing by uploading the blog talks. She's able to hear them. You know, you're able to go back to them. So Yah is really pulling us together and using this show to do it, and I'm so thankful to be a part of it. I want to go back over with no other phone calls, Sister Jennifer, to Chapter 7 of Second Maccabees. Um, who is the sister that we may use, Sister Jennifer? Do you have someone in mind? Yes, ma'am. Let's use Sister Gabby from Kansas City. Let's use... Sister Gabby from Kansas City. Beautiful choice. All right. Let's start at verse 1. It came to pass also that seven brethren with their mother, seven brethren with Sister Gabby, were taken and compelled by the king or the president against the law to taste swine's flesh, and they were tormented with scourges and whips. They were being beaten, sisters. One of them, one of the brothers, one of her children that spake first said thus, What would thou ask or learn of us? We are ready to die rather than to transgress the laws of our fathers. Then the king, being in a rage, commanded pans and cauldrons to be made hot, which forthwith being heated, he commanded to cut out the tongue of him that spake first and to cut off the utmost parts of his body. And the rest of his brethren and his mother, Sister Gabby, were looking on. Verse 5. Now when he was thus maimed in all his members, he commanded him, being yet alive, to be brought to the fire and to be fried in the pan. So after his tongue is cut off, after his limbs, his legs, his arms are cut off, you can imagine his body. It commanded him to be brought over to the fire and to be fried in the pan. Let's continue. And as the vapor of the pan was for a good space dispersed, meaning it's hot. They exhorted one another with the mother to die manfully. So Sister Gabby and all her brethren, her her sons, are saying, The Lord Yah looketh upon us, and in truth have comfort in us, as Moses in his song, which witnessed to their faces, declared, saying, And he shall be comforted in his servants. So when the first was dead after this manner, now mind you, paint this picture in your mind. You and your sons are wa- are watching your son, Sister Gabby's son, in a pan without limbs and without a tongue. And there's no panic even expressed in her. She has such an internal peace and an ability to be self-controlled that she can coach her children through this entire process that she's waded through all the hell and the mire that this culture has put upon us sister gabby has waded through it all to get to this moment in time number seven again so when the first was dead after this manner they brought the second to make him a mocking stock and when they had pulled off the skin of his head with the hair they asked him Will thou eat before thou be punished throughout every member of their body? So they've already pulled off the skin of his head with his hair. Looks like the Indians weren't the first scalpers as the white man makes them out to be. It's written right here. Pulled off the skin of his head with his hair and they ask him, Will you eat before you be punished throughout every member of your body? You have a, a an amazing strength about you if you're able to utter... Yahweh and his promises and all his, um, you know, encouraging words that come forth out of this man after you've had your scalp ripped off and your hair, script, you know, stripped off. That's an amazing, amazing courage. Number eight says, but he answered it in his own language and said, no. Wherefore, he also received the next torment in order as the former did. And when he was at the last gasp, he said, Thou, like a fury, 
takest us out of this present life, but the king of the world shall raise us up who have died for his laws unto everlasting life. He says that without his scalp and without his hair. Amazing. Number 10, after him was the third made a mocking stock. And when he was required, he put out his tongue and that right soon holding forth his hands. He stuck his hands out and he put his tongue out and said courageously, these I had from heaven and for his laws I despise them. And from him I hope to receive them again. Why does he despise them? Because they've caused him nothing but pain all his life. Our, our hands and our tongue, quick to sin. Number 11, and said courageously, these I had from heaven, and for his laws I despise them. And from him I hope to receive them again. Insomuch that the king and they that were with him marveled at the young man's courage, for that he nothing regarded the pains. Now, when this man was dead also, they tormented and mangled the fourth in like manner. Sister Gabby's fourth son is being killed in like manner. So when he was ready to die, he said thus, It is good, being put to death by men, to look for hope from Yah to be raised up again by him. And as for thee, thou shalt have no resurrection to life. And afterward, they brought the fifth also, and they mangled him. Now, the mom is watching all of this verse 16 then they looked then looked he unto the king and he said thou hast power over men thou art corruptible thou doest what thou wilt yet think not that our nation is forsaken of Yah but abide a while and behold his great power how he will torment thee and thy seed after him also they brought the sixth sister Gabby's sixth son is going forward who being ready to die said be not deceived without cause for we suffer these things for ourselves, having sinned against our Yah. Therefore marvelous things are done unto us. But think not thou, that takest in hand to strive against Yah, that thou shalt escape unpunished. Here's verse 20. The highlight from this, this night, this highlight, right here, highlighted. But the mother was marvelous above all and worthy of honorable memory. For when she saw, Sister Gabby saw her seven sons slain within the space of one day, she bare it with a good courage because of the hope that she had in Yahweh. Yea, she exhorted every one of them in her own language, filled with courageous spirits, and stirring up her womanish thoughts with a manly stomach, she said unto them, I cannot tell you how you came into my womb, for I neither gave you breath nor life, Neither was it I that formed the members of every one of you. But doubtless, the creator of the world, who formed the generation of man and found out the beginning of all things, will also of his own mercy give you breath and life again, as ye now regard not your own selves for his law's sake. Now Antiochus, president, thinking himself despised and suspecting it to be a reproachful while the youngest was yet alive, did not only exhort him by words, but also assured him with oaths that he would make him both a rich and a happy man if he would turn from the laws of his fathers, and that also he would take him for his friend and trust him with affairs. So, stop right there and think, calling over this seventh son, this last one, I'll make you everything you want to be if you just do this for me, serve me. You'll be my friend. I'll trust you with many affairs. When the young man, verse 25, would in no case hearken unto him, the king called his mother and exhorted her that she would counsel the young man to save his life. This is the type of strength that should be in each and every one of us. If we don't have it now, we will. His mercy is upon us. We must get this, sisters. We must have this wisdom in us to build our house. And when he had exhorted her with many words, she promised him that she would counsel her son. Oh, yes, sir, President. Yes, sir. Gabby is in full submission. So she looks and appears. Full submission to this president that I will do everything you're saying. Yes, sir. No problem. Verse 27. But she bowing herself towards him, laughing the cruel tyrant to a scorn, spake in her country language on this manner. Oh, my son, have pity upon me that bear thee nine months in my womb. And gave thee suck three years. 
and nourished thee and brought thee up unto this age and endured the troubles of education. Endure, enduring the troubles of education, might I interject, would be a, a homeschooling environment and not sending them off to private school because that's not enduring any form of trouble of education. Verse 28, I beseech thee, my son, look upon the heaven and the earth and all that is therein, and consider that Yah made them of things that were not, and so was mankind made likewise. Everything, son, that you see was created by Yahweh Elohim, Yeshua, Jesus the Christ. She's encouraging him. Verse 29 says, Fear not this tormentor, but being worthy of thy brethren, take thy death that I may receive thee again in mercy with thy brethren. While she was yet speaking these words, the young man said, Whom wait ye for? So he's looking at the president saying, What are you waiting for? I'm ready. I will not obey the king's command, but I will obey the commandment of the law that was given unto our fathers by Moshe. And thou that has been the author of all mischief against the Hebrews shall not escape the hands of Yah, for we suffer because of our sins. And through the living Yahweh be angry with us, though the living Yahweh be angry with us a little while for our chastening and correction, yet shall he be at one again with his servants. But thou, O godless man, and of all other most wicked, be not lifted up without a cause, nor puffed up with uncertain hopes, lifting up thy hand against the servants of Yah. For thou hast not yet escaped the judgment of Almighty Yah, who seeth all things. For our brethren who now have suffered a short pain are dead under Yah's covenant of everlasting life. But thou, through the judgment of Yah, shall receive just punishment for thy pride. But I, as my brethren, offer up my body and life for the laws of our fathers, beseeching Yah that he would speedily be merciful unto our nation, and that thou, by torments and plagues, may confess that he alone is Yah. And that in me and my brethren, the wrath of the Almighty, which is justly brought upon all our nation, may cease. Then the king, being in a rage, handled him worse than all the rest, and took it grievously that he was mocked. So this man died undefiled and put his whole trust in the Lord, Yahweh. And last of all, after the sons, the mother died. Let this be enough now to have spoken concerning the adulterous feasts and the extreme tortures. This was an amazing woman. She exemplified her life and Yeshua's nature to her children, not just in a short time span, but for, for years. It was in their hearts to die for the king. And it's hard sometimes to, to even fathom what may come. There's words pastor uses like cognitive dissonance where we remain the same way that we are, not being able to accept any change in custom tradition or belief or anything that may come our way. And when you think of the word cognitive dissonance, cognitive meaning associated with the brain and the thought process, the logic. Dissonance is the information that you're introduced to. Cognitive dissonance is the mental stress that you go through when you are confronted with another belief, another tradition, another way that is foreign to your mind. And we're all familiar with that mental stress. You know, patriarchal rule, polygyny, all that brought forth a change in your mind, in your custom. That everything that we knew was, was torn to the ground. Well, it's easy to deflect to... You know what? I don't I don't want to endure this mental stress. You know, I don't want to I don't want to change. So I'm just going to push this in the back of my mind. I'm just going to um overcome it that way. Overcome it by putting it in the back of my mind. Just not thinking about it, you know? Because we we're, we're masters at suppressing things, sisters. So we can actually deceive ourselves into believing that we're overcoming natures by suppressing natures. And that's not what the message is tonight. It's to face the nature that is within you so that you will be ready for what is coming to you like it or not. Sister Jennifer, what say you? You know, you <clears throat> think about Mother Bullock and how she um, entreated the sisters um, on the broadcast on sixth day going into Shabbat. And she said that she laid herself before the Father 
and she asked him to remove every tradition of man that was within her. And, you know, you listen to Pastor Dow, um, the scripture study, and, and, you know, he talked about the liberal mindset. And, I mean, this is something that we need to be doing. We really need to lay before the Father and ask him to remove this liberal mindset, this American mindset. I mean, I mean, it was such sound words that she spoke. It was so simple, so practical, but how many of us are really doing it? We, we have a long way to go. We really do. And I'm really blessed by Sister Tiffany's call. Can you imagine being in a situation, the story in Maccabee, you know, we know that spirits manifest physically in our bodies. And so could you imagine if this woman had fear on her, could you imagine the fear actually manifesting itself in her body and her having to deal with that? You know, Sister Tiffany said when she started to praise the Father, the pain lifted. And so we we really need to learn how to fight the spirit. We need to learn how to fight in our minds. We need to learn how to um, really lay ourselves before the Father and ask him, remove this liberal mindset, remove every tradition of man, this fearful mindset that the devil has placed in us so that we can be women like in Second Maccabees. Yes, and so we can ask ourselves the question, if I'm not submitting to my husband silently or openly, how am I mocking Yah? Because, you know, he he ain't got it together. He ain't got it figured out. He likes his towels folded this way, and I like them that way. It's a bunch of carnality that truly separates the both of you. So how am I mocking him? That's that's the question. You have before you the established order written in the same book I hold before me right now, the established order of Yeshua over the man, the man over the woman, and the woman over the children. It is your choice and your decision to choose life and to submit to that order regardless of faults, failures, flaws, and things that you see that he may have because he's not in question. We are. Our submission is in, in, in question. Mocking, when you look it up, is to deride or to, to speak unintelligibly and to laugh and to scorn. And we can do that. We, we focus in tonight on that word silent because we can do that under our breath. We can we can wait till he's out of the atmosphere, just like children do. Wait until mom and dad is gone to do to do wrong. We can wait until hubby's gone to do our own will and do our own way. Job thirteen nine says, "Is it good that he should search you out?" Yes, it is. Absolutely, it's good that he search you out. It's good that he search you out through that pulpit, through this blog talk, through the elders' blog talks, in any way that he searches you out, sisters. He's going to find you out. It's a good thing because if he didn't, my husband uses the word defibrillator on your mind. A defibrillator is something that they bring you to life with, you know, that shocking instrument in the hospitals that they set on your, you know, they rub the cream on your chest and then they lay the defibrillator down and it shocks you and it brings you back to life. Because we're so quick to be at ease, we have to be defibrillated. We have to be continually reminded, you know, oh, man, here we go again. Sister Ashley, Sister Jennifer talking about the end of the world coming, you know, talking about change is coming, environmental change is coming. we got to get our spirits ready. Here we go again. And I don't think any of you respond in that way, but spirits can. And spirits can keep you bound by their way of thinking if you don't recognize their communication to you. Job 13.9, again, is it good that he should search you out, or as one man mocketh another, do ye so mock him? So as one man mocks another, do you really want to mock Yah? As you mock your husband, as you wait, i got to share this story. I always tell you, when I when I hear from the Spirit, it's not often, so I don't ever want to seem like, oh, I just hear straight from the throne all the time, by any means, no way. When you're a spiritual being, you can hear from your own, you know, your own spirit, and you can hear uh, still small voices. You know, uh, more often than not, when you get a, an inner peace about yourself, you can really be led by the spirit. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to conceive, and I know what it's like to be or feel barren. You know, and I really wanted to conceive, and I wanted a child really bad, and I would cry out, and I would actually cry through my emotions because I felt, you know, I felt the reproach. I didn't really understand why. I had to wait so long, 
And I was actually, here's the funny thing, so hypocritically coming from the perspective that I didn't want any children, right? So I don't want any children, so I'm cursing myself throughout my American liberalism coming into the faith, I don't want any. And then justifying it coming into the faith because woe unto them who give suck in those days. So I, you know, I stick a, a scripture onto my, onto my belief, right? So now that my husband says, you know what, we're, we're going to try. We're going to have a baby. Now all of a sudden I flip a motion and say something's wrong with me. Now I'm being beat up because I'm not having any. You know, now I'm, now I'm flip-flopping. Y'all, I'm sure some of y'all can really, really relate to this story. So I would cry. I would literally cry. I would try to pray. I would try to really understand, you know, why why it was important to wait. You know, I thought I thought he would hear Israel. You know, we would be blessed and no barren amongst us, and we would just, you know, whenever we want to conceive, we could just conceive. That was just that was my thoughts early on. You know, in a marriage. One day I was at the uh, I was at my kitchen. I was cleaning up my kitchen. My husband was at the table. He was still eating, and I was finishing up. And I see your your phone call, my lovely sister Toya. Um, I'll be with you in just a moment. Let me finish my story. Um, and in the in my own spirit, I'm just complaining. Like you know, we've tried everything. There's the there's the basal thermometer. There's the mucus test. There's the temperature test. There's the time of the month chart. Every 15 days, every 12 days, according to your. I mean, there's every, I've tried it all, and I'm just expressing to him. Now I'm expressing to him in a manner that he may not be able to detect my spirit, right? Because he's just listening to, yeah, you know, my wife here, she goes again, she's on a rant, she's complaining. Because he knew it was my, I would often express my weakness to him. You know, it really bothers me that I'm not able to conceive. So he puts himself in a place of listening. And you know what I heard so clearly? It interrupted my thoughts. It made me shut up from that moment on, and I never uttered anything else to my husband or to Yahweh. I heard in my spirit, Sarah laughed. And it stopped me cold in my feet. Go back and read it. Read about Sarah. Let's talk about Sarah next week, matter of fact, just to just to go there. I wanted to go Susanna, so we'll go Susanna. Be reading Susanna throughout the next week because we may go there next. But let's go Sarah so that y'all can understand just even my comment. Sarah laughed. Wow. It let me know that I was mocking Yah and his power. It really let me know that regardless of my husband sitting there enduring me complain, Yahweh knew my spirit, and it wasn't, it wasn't righteous. It was not righteous. Let's go to the phone lines, Sister Toya. If we are correct, four one zero. Can you hear me, four one zero? Yes, ma'am. Bless you, Sister Jennifer. Bless you, Sister Ashley. Shalom. Shalom. Bless you. Shalom. Um. I know that you, y'all have said uh, ask questions, you know, maybe for some for newer saints who may yes. not understand. So when you, so I thought about when you said um, when, you, when talking about the husband and the wife may be looking at his issues and you know she knows that he doesn't have things together. Um, you, you said uh, he's not in question. You're in question. So maybe you could just, like, elaborate so to give a better understanding of of that. Absolutely. Because, you know, okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Is that is, – okay, that's it. That's a good question. Let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, bless you, Sister Toya. Shalom to Sister uh, Larry L. if she's still with you. Shalom. Yes, she is. Shalom. All right. Shalom. Shalom, shalom. All right. A very good, um, very good question because I always, sometimes in my passion, I can express things in a way that is broad. So let's hone it in, Sister Jennifer. I hope you heard her question because I'm going to go to you next. I just want to say this first: when you are in a servant's mentality, an Abigail's mentality, Nabal is not in question to you. It's not about who's just or who is right because all of that is truly carnal. It's who's in authority and who's in subjection and we should keep ourselves in a spirit of humility and submission regardless of failures faults and things that we may see see biting of the apple gave us the ability to see knowledge and good or even good and evil it allows us to to have a um 
wise to be evil mentality. And so we can actually perceive or or understand things in a different light than our husband, so we exalt ourselves above him. And when we see him in a lowered estate or in a weakened area, we can automatically uh, exalt ourselves or assume ourselves to be better or that we've arrived in that area. And so it, it slips us far from submission. It's a it's a proud, haughty nature that, that just keeps us ahead of the game. Sister Jennifer, talk to me. Yes, ma'am. We're you know, as women we're not strong enough to see every single weakness of our husbands. And I'm not saying that you'll never see it, but we're not strong enough. And if we're only focusing on them and their weaknesses and we're not allowing Yah to deal with us, then our focus is wrong. You know, we always need to be focused on our areas where we need to change and not look at the other person. And we never know. It doesn't mean that the father is not dealing with your husband. It just means that you need to continue to stay in a humble state. And that's the only way that you can stay in a humble state is when you are always willing to see yourself for who you are you know, and, and not because it's really kind of a, a mocking thing. If if you look at his weakness and you're um you're in a state of, of prideful, you're you're in a prideful state, you're really mocking Yah. And and you can actually fall into the same temptation. So, you know, we're just not strong enough to see every single weakness. We're we're not strong enough to have our husbands lay in our bosom and, and to tell us every single thing. We're just not strong enough for it. So we always have to stay in a state of humility and submission because our protection is in our submission. And every time you are humble, then Yahweh will come and he'll bring the correction. He always does it. He will always come and bring the correction. He's never, ever failed us. He never has and he never will. So we always have to stay in a, a, a state of humility and he will always come and correct that which needs to be corrected. Absolutely. And because none of us truly understand what it's like to be a servant, what if, um, let's say, for example, let's give Sister Jennifer Elder Rufus, you know, and, and they they needed a servant. You know, they really weren't weren't getting the things done in, in their home. They needed a servant, so they reach out and they say, hey, um, uh, Sister, Sister Toya, just because she called in, you know. Hey, Sister Toya, we really need you. We need your help. We need you to come in, get this done, get this job done. Um, this is your duty. For all the days of your life, we'll, we will give you food, meat. We will make sure that you are taken care of all the days of your life. You will not lack anything. But when you come into our home, you are under our submission. You will listen and obey me, Elder Rufus, as your head, and and Sister Jennifer as your head head wife in the house. Uh, This is what we need you to do. So Sister Toya packs up, moves in, and she's a servant. Now, you know what? Elder Rufus and Sister Jennifer ain't perfect. They ain't got it figured out. So I think I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna pick out all their faults and their failures and their flaws, and I'm gonna sit in my room and just meditate on them. I'm gonna meditate on them because they just ain't right. And I got a phone call from the dining hall. Sister Jennifer, can you can you paint the picture with me and for me? Yes, ma'am, absolutely. And so then the servant will look at the what she thinks is the wickedness of the masters. And then she'll think that it's okay to go ahead and um, drop the you know, ball. Just kind of present her. Yeah, drop the ball, exactly. Drop the ball. It's okay for me to just slack up and do whatever I want to because this is what the authority is doing. And that's no excuse. It's really not. You know, we need to do right. We need to do right in the sight of Yah, regardless of what we see going on. You know, Yah could be dealing with the... Um, the heads. Yahweh could be dealing with the heads on their weaknesses. We just never know what he's doing. But if we drop the ball as wives, as servants, and we drop the ball, then we have other people looking at us as well. And everybody else is going to think they can drop the ball. And then it's going to make Israel weak. 
Absolutely, good words, because we have all been brought into this ministry as a servant. We we don't see the, the payment yet, but we have a requirement on our hands not to murmur and complain, not to see others as, as less than us, especially our husbands, and to just serve, to just serve. Just do unto your husband regardless of, you know what? Every time he goes into the bathroom, he makes a spill around the sink, and he gets really, really mad, and he blames me, okay? And so because I need to go immediately into the bathroom and clean up the sink or I'm going to get yelled at, then you know what? I need to go immediately into the bathroom and clean the sink. He's not to blame because he he it's his hair on the sink. He just shaved. It's his toothpaste. He's not to blame. That's what I mean by regardless of him, you change, and regardless of him, you serve. You find so much peace in submission. Your house stays clean, your sink stays clean, and he's at peace. You don't get blamed for the mess continually. It's you, it's you, it's you, it's you, it's always you. It's never him because you did right, and you were in, I'm telling you, we're, we're going we're gonna to appear or seem to, to be blamed you know, or to think that, man, I just can't please him, that's not the case. It's truly not the case. It's our perception. Even though their speech, their 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 ways may be contrary to ours or different than ours, we just need to understand him. I need to understand my husband more than Sister Carolina because she's serving a different man. So she has to understand her man in a different way, and she needs to please and serve him on a greater scale than I please and serve him. I'm over here. I'm over here serving mine. Regardless of of his faults and failures, she's still serving. It's our way into the kingdom. It's it's an easy, if you want to call it escape, it's easy. It's really easy. 2 Peter 3.10 But the day of Yahweh will come as a thief in the night, and in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be, sisters, in all holy conversation and godliness, Looking and hastening unto the coming of Yahweh, your Elohim, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. That's not in question. What will happen to the heavens and the earth is not in question. It's written about. What will happen to you is in question. Your conversation should be holy, and you should have godliness. We're going to get there. I'm excited. I tell you that every show. I'm excited. I get to hear, you know, from the sisters, the 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 encouragement they re- they receive from the show. You know, I get to get excited when I sit down mostly on a on a second day night. That seems to be my best night to just sit down and try to write scriptures and prepare for the the following fifth day. I just get excited. I get this burning in me to express to y'all that you know what? Change is coming. Everything around you is going to change. But you cannot alter your opinion or your behavior contrary from Yahweh Elohim. You should practice right now a manner about you, a seriousness about you that, you know what, it doesn't take your volume of your voice to get your children's attention. Get over here, Johnny. I said, sit down. No. Get over here, son. Sit down. Get over here. I said, sit down. You don't teach them to panic. You teach them to serve. Teach them immediate obedience. We should have it in us, immediate obedience. I know I kind of veer off course, but I hope it's really uh, painting a picture for you, for you all tonight, sisters, that we have a very high honorable position that because we've never operated in it, we're in a lack of understanding. Our numbers continually grow every show because I know that every one of us wants to serve Yahweh. We want to be holy. We sing the songs from our heart. We serve with all our heart. But we still, we're missing the mark. We're missing the mark. And I hope that our show can continue to expose the things in the areas that we come up on. Sister Jennifer, anything? You know, look at Abigail and look at um, 
I mean, look at her husband. Look at Nabal. Look at his wickedness. But she was still a righteous woman. She was still a woman of understanding. And I'm so happy that she was. You know, and we need to we need to really strive to be like Abigail was. A woman of understanding, a righteous woman, regardless of the situation. And Abigail didn't say, oh, this is a wicked man, so I can just, I can slack. I can do whatever I want to do. You know, really look at Abigail. Really look at these these women that we're discussing and really learn from them. Absolutely, Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, 1 and 3 says, You are all dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the ruler of the authority of the air. I'm in the Hallelujah Scriptures, by the way. Of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So we walked according to what is now working in the sons of disobedience. Verse 3, among whom also we all once lived in the lust of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we're by nature children of wrath, as also the rest. So we were children of everything you could you could fathom in the flesh and in the mind. That's what we were children of, you know. And you come into the faith, you're no longer those children. You're no longer a children of wrath. So don't have wrath ingrained into you where you're going to spew it out of your mouth towards your children or towards your husband in any way. From this point on, build your house. Build it spiritually, even the more so if you know financially you cannot naturally support your home or your husband can't naturally support or get everything you need for the time that's coming. You can't get the silver that you want or you can't get the food that you want or you can't uproot your homes and your lives like you want and move to to straightway or nearby because that's not an option. Get yourself spiritually prepared. You will make it. It's an encouragement. It really truly is. Let's go Ephesians 4, my last one, because we're in the last five minutes of the show. Ephesians 4, verse 22. If indeed, I'm starting at verse 20, let me see, number 20. You have not so learned Messiah. If indeed you have heard him and were taught by him as truth in Yeshua, that you put off with regard to your former behavior, the old man, being corrupted according to the desires of the deceit, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed, my sisters. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. From this show forward, be renewed. Don't be condemned when you fail. Keep pressing. If you see an evil nature in you, change it. If you see an evil nature in your children that abides first and foremost in you, change it. You have to change you to see any form of change in them. Get them serious about Yeshua HaMashiach. Don't make them quick to panic because the time is coming and the change is coming. It's coming real soon. Listen to the Spirit. Come out of her. Come out of her, my people. Sister Jennifer, last words. I always give you last words, but I end up rambling in the end. So anything else, my sister? You know, I think it's important that we go over Ecclesiasticus chapter 25 where it talks about the wickedness of a woman and you know it just really talks about the wicked nature of a woman and it's good to visit that it's good to visit chapter 25 of Ecclesiasticus because we know what we need to turn away from you know every day it's just really good to focus on that because I think that we just take it for granted we we a lot of times take Yahweh for granted and we think that we're doing well but we deceive ourselves a lot. So, you know, it's a good idea to really look at Ecclesiasticus chapter 25, the wickedness of a woman, and strive to be the opposite of that. Hallelujah. That's your homework. We're going to talk about Sarah next week. We're going to uh, hopefully, if y'all have the time and set aside the time to read Ecclesiasticus chapter 25, know this, that if you have the nature to blame your husband for the situation you're in now, you will definitely blame him in the upcoming times for having no water and no food and this and that and all the complaints that may occur under your roof because the environmental change that's ahead of us, you will not change your nature when the environment changes around you. It's time now to make a change. 
Uh, Sister Jennifer, thank you always for being faithful, calling in early enough for us to uh, en- enjoy the show together. Thank you, Sister Tiffany, uh, Sister Toya, the callers tonight, Sister Dory. Welcome to the Straightway Truth and welcome to the fight. Shalom, sisters. We love you all. Sister Jennifer, anything left? Five seconds. Shalom. Bless you, sisters. Hallelujah. Shalom.